This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joie. Brought to you by Audible. Stay tuned for a special offer at the end of the show. Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joar, and today is Thursday, September 9th, 2021, and my guest is the awesome, the excellent Ryan Hager of Android Police. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm good, Miriam. How are you? I'm super cool. I think this has been a weird week because there's a lot of news, but it's not super impactful. You know, it's like, I actually found a whole bunch of stuff and we're probably going to rapid fire through a bunch of it with tangents. I think I want to start with Android 12 beta five or whatever it is. I know you wrote a bunch of articles yesterday or the day before about this. And, you know, I'm not a huge, like I'm for an Android user. I'm kind of a terrible Android user because I never get excited about the new releases of Android. I don't know what it is. It's just like, whatever, it's fine. I, I don't get excited by the new release of iOS either, to be frank. To me, it just has to work. Does it work? Well, so far, Android 12 is that much closer to working. We just hit release candidate stage. So if you haven't been following along, uh, Beta 5 is uh, probably going to be the last version we see, barring any bug fixing updates. Google's been doing that recently. Uh, Started it last year and this year. They occasionally do these like 0.1 incremental releases between the betas that fix major problems, although they've but forgetting to fix a few major problems. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're basically ready. We're going to have a uh, stable landing. It sounds like in the next couple of weeks, probably before uh, the end of the month. Uh, and we're just about there. You're, you're, you're going to have it on your Pixel. And when the Pixel 6 lands, it'll probably almost certainly be running Android 12. That's exciting. Again, I'm happy about that. I'm just point I kind of like, you know, just deliver the thing. I'm, I'm ready. I mean, it's a few weeks away now, right? So... Well, it is a bigger change, I would say, at least visually, than uh, the last couple of releases have been, because we've been, you know, riding on the the sort of material redesign uh, for the last several years, really, and now we get the snazzy, fancy, dynamic, color-changing material U, which has uh, this uh, really interesting system called, uh, I believe, the working term for it was Monet, that is able to pick colors. Uh, in using very advanced logic from your background and in doing so dynamically change the background of uh, content in compatible apps and buttons and widgets and all sorts of different UI elements can be dynamically themed. And it's, it's, it's actually going to be a very big visual change. Yeah, no, I think it looks good. What I've seen so far has got me excited. I can't say I'm not excited fully. I think the design is exciting. I'm just not really that worried so much about the features i'm more like will this work and feel just as delightful as what you know android feels like on a pixel today or more delightful i think it'll be more delightful yeah i have no doubts that'll be the case i feel like google can't mess that up like that that just you know wouldn't be smart for them yeah so let's see what happens right i guess (laughs) yeah that's kind of the proof is in the pudding kind of a part of, of Android 12. For me, it's more like, let's get into my hands and, and on a phone that is like mission critical, because if it's like on a developer phone and then I'm forgiving, right? Like I'm like, Oh, that crashed. Oh, big deal. You know, but now I'm just like, I'm working. God damn it. Make this go. But we're that much closer with the release candidate. The bugs are at a minimum. Um, and uh, Google's been rolling out the last couple of features we've been waiting for. So when they showed off material, you at first, you know, now we have the, uh, uh, the new widgets landed as part of that. They fixed a couple of the ongoing issues, uh, uh, some of the early bugs that were spotted. Uh, more of the built-in apps now support Material U. It's still on developers to uh, uh, for third-party apps to pick up support if they ever will. But we're 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 getting pretty close now. Yeah. What would you say of your experience using it so far in all the various beta version? Is the thing that other than Material Design or Material U, sorry, is the thing that really stands out that you feel is going to be like something that we'll look back and say, yeah, that was that was Android 12. Um, I think it's pretty easy to get caught in the weeds when you look at everything at the feature level like I have to and focus on, on things with tunnel vision one at a time. Yeah, that's why I'm like asking you to zoom back and do the, the drone's yeah. eye view here. I think the biggest changes we're going to notice looking back or looking forward, uh, and it's 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 hard to make marketable. It's hard to make sexy. But the, uh, the privacy changes in Android 12, the new privacy indicator, there's a whole new privacy dashboard. Uh, 
Google's, I would, I would, I would hesitate to say that they've been ignoring people's privacy. That's not true. But they've uh, never taken as much of an effort until now to unify, right. and present it to all of you at once in such an easy way. Uh, and uh, so that's that's going to be something we look back on as well. That was a big change. So speaking of material, you, I didn't put this in the topics, but you probably saw the video that Google published, like yesterday, today, whenever it was about. Uh, somebody actually, you know, like you, you, it's basically a Pixel Six ad, right? <laughs> yep. So, anything you saw in there that that you didn't know about that makes you go, "Ooh." Well, I mean, most of the details that were in there, um, Google Google did, uh, and they've been doing that recently as well. You know, they they're early. Here's our here's our phone. Three months, four months before yeah, it comes so out, weird, they, eh? they like leak it. I love it. I think it's a great idea. If if, if leaks are going to happen already, at least then you're in control of the conversation. They're they're showing off the features themselves. So there wasn't too much new. You know, we know it's going to have the Tensor chip. Uh, there were some interesting details in there. It's hard to make any predictions, but uh, uh, previously when Google's shown off this sort of stuff, sometimes the dates that you see in the corner or in the clock around the time can be meaningful in an indirect right. way. And it's October and 19th, right? Yeah, so one of the dates that came up in the video was Tuesday the 19th. And, you know, I don't I don't know um, that the last Tuesday the 19th before the end of the year is going to be October 19th. And that generally lines up with the sort of recent leaks we've been hearing. But uh, there were also a whole lot of other times and dates in that video. So I don't know if yeah, I... Yeah, there's September 30th in there, right? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm thinking we might see... Um, if if we're going to speculate based on the dates in the video, September 30th could be uh, the Android 12 release date. September 30th ah. could be Google's announcement and then uh, pre-orders open on the 19th. Or September 30th could be when pre-orders open and then it ships on the 19th. Who knows? I, I, I don't even want to speculate, but... Uh, um, it, it does seem like we're, we're, it's right around the corner. Android 12 will be released in just a couple weeks and the Pixel 6 will be hot on its heels uh, next month sometime. Yeah, I feel the same way. We're going to have a busy September and October we will mention later in the show uh, about Apple's September 13th thing. But anyway, let's not get carried away. I want to also talk about a video that came out like a week and a half ago or something. I forgot to put it in the show notes for last week, but it's actually pretty fun. And it's the circle video that kind of Google this, this Johnny Ive parody video about the headphone jack. And I'll link it in the show notes alongside the Material U video, the latest one. Um, what, what were your thoughts on this video? Do you think that Google's like trying a little too hard here or is it actually genuinely funny? I think it's kind of funny, but I also think it's like pretty hypocritical because you remember um, during the original Pixel launch uh, at the like the Made by Google event, the first Pixel. Oh, yeah. They made that satisfyingly not new claim about the headphone jack only to drop the headphone jack the very next year, throwing shade at Apple, even as the product managers for the Pixel 2, sitting in that very audience, had to know they weren't going to be including it in the next product. So it that that always rubbed me the wrong way, that Google advertised it as, well, at least we said you had to Yeah, yeah, well, Sa Samsung did the same, right? Remember? They made fun yeah, of exactly. Apple, and then the next year, they dropped the headphone jack, too. So, like, I, I, I do think it's funny, the whole Johnny Ive parody and just the, the, the sort of irreverence in the video. But at the same time, like, Google should not be drawing attention to a feature that they're willing to continue to include in a budget phone, a mid-range phone, that they refuse to include in their flagships, in which they, you know, hypocritically took away and tried to lampshade that fact. But no, we still have it in our mid-range phone. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... Uh, I find this weird division artificial barrier is so bizarre too like if true wireless earbuds are a dime a dozen these days and really affordable if you if you look at it why would you just not remove it altogether from all your phones or conversely why not always still include the headphone jack because you know flagships are flagships they should have everything it's weird to me it's like weird that we're creating these artificial i don't know like feature sets and we're going to talk about this in a minute with uh, Samsung's A series and OIS coming to it. Like OIS is another thing that I just don't understand other than the money. I get the cost issue, but if it just pisses me off that you can't get that on a mid range and that even some flagships like, oh, cough one plus nine, seriously, one plus the Nord two has OIS. It's brilliant because of it. Like yeah. it's a better phone than the one plus nine because of it. 
Like seriously, like how 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 is this even happening? LG was so guilty of that too, with the um, with the Velvet, one of their best phones, but <laughs> not on the imaging side because they just drop a simple little feature like that. It's just weird. So, yeah, yeah I just found the video funny. And I think it's funny too, but I also think it's hypocritical. Yeah, it is a little. It's kind of feels like. The machine is so big, Google, right? That the marketing department itself is fractured and fragmented. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, like the lack of consistency is jarring to me, but that's just me. So yeah, um, we'll see what happens there. But um, speaking of software updates and security updates, did you see this, that Germany wants at least security updates to be available for various mobile OSs for seven years now. I mean, it's in discussion. It's not law yet. What do you think? I am wildly in favor of this. And I think that phones should be as updated as, as long as they possibly can be. I think it's kind of arbitrary. And we can we can debate the precise reasons behind it, whether it's Qualcomm, whether it's the manufacturers, you know, who is ultimately responsible is... Uh, uh, a subject that could be discussed for a whole podcast. But uh, I do think that, especially in the world of Android, hardware is abandoned before its time. Uh, it has a negative impact on uh, the environment and sustainability because these devices are still perfectly good. And replacing yeah. a battery is a, a cheap and easy operation. But once you stop getting updates, it's no longer secure to use. Even with uh, the way that ways that Google has decoupled updates from the system, and you have things like uh, the project mainline builds and uh, Little little pieces that can be updated within the system without changing the system itself. Nonetheless, if you if we have a big vulnerability that does require a system update, and these happen you know fairly regularly, and if one of them ends up being widespread use like stage fright, uh, it it's no longer secure to use that phone. You can't use it for online banking. You you probably don't even want to sign into your Google account on it. It's it's a security issue that could impact your life pretty severely. So phones should last longer. They should. We should all be doing better. I agree 100%. I just still think that seven years is unrealistic as somebody who worked in software. Yeah. It's a huge amount of time. It is. I agree with that. Five, I think, yeah. is a sweet spot. Yeah, I think five you know, is Apple's good. pretty much there. Samsung's getting there. Google's getting there. I'm not talking about OS like upgrades. I'm talking about just you know security and other like critical updates. Five years, I think, is reasonable. A five-year-old phone. I, I have no qualms imagining somebody using a five-year-old phone in the ios world but i can't even fathom right now somebody using an android phone for five years i certainly wouldn't yeah it, it, it depends there are certain models that i would say are all right for it. some of the uh high-end samsung flagships from from five years ago what would that be like uh, galaxy s9 series right now galaxy s8 series s8 some of those yeah. would some of those would last. The original Pixel would be coming up on five years now. And uh, the original Pixel is still a, a fairly capable device. The camera in it matches the camera that's in the uh, uh, Pixel 5, right? And Not really. Chipset. It doesn't have OIS. Yeah, it doesn't have OIS, but uh, the sensor is the same. Yeah, the sensor is the same. I mean, it's interesting. Like, I think that, you know, I'm all for it too, but I think seven years is a little much. I'm not sure how they came up with that number either. It's like so weird and arbitrary to me. Five years, I think, is a reasonable amount. And I hope the industry... I mean, clearly Samsung's paying attention. And I think Apple has, in some ways, kind of drawn the attention of the general public to these issues in some way by, you know... And, and I think us as journalists have been very adamant about it for a while now. And I think I'm glad, like, I'm not too surprised Google's doing it. But I'm kind of also surprised because they don't really have that many devices out there in the great scheme of things. But Samsung, I think... That was critical. Yeah. And right? I, I think it was a little little nuts that Samsung sort of beat Google to its own game there. Like Google makes Android and Google can't be bothered to update the Pixels for longer than three years of like OS updates and security patches. The Pixel 2 was abandoned like two years, uh, two months to the date after it came out three years later. So, yeah. you know, the fact that Samsung is, is beating Google there... Uh, Google should be embarrassed, and I hope that when they uh, <laughs> release the Pixel 6 this year with the Tensor chip that ostensibly, you know, end-to-end, -end, they're in control of. They did the software. They helped design it. Uh, there are rumors that they're, that they're going to promise five years of updates, which would be a big deal. Uh, and I, I, I hope that's true because up until this point, it's been uh, – uh, I, th I think I wrote about this, but I think it's kind of uh, – uh, I think it's outright embarrassing and a little ridiculous that they're um, – 
advertising using recycled plastic in the Nest mini speakers, and yet they won't update a phone that'll do way more for the environment than reusing half a plastic bottle's worth of plastic on a speaker. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like this is a good thing. And, you know, seven might be much, and that's it. But I've, I want to see more. I, I feel like Samsung, I'm really liking what Samsung's doing. Speaking of which, I was agree. that your flip we were hearing earlier? Because I have one. It was. Too. I'm so sorry. I uh, I should mute it. It's Look so at good. that. Oh no, mine is the the fold. Oh, it's the fold. I have the, you fold, the fold. Yeah. I got the I creamsicle both. going on here. No, I don't have the fold though. That is the best color. That is the best color. Mine is in the purple case. I'm reviewing this for Hot Hardware right now, so stay tuned, folks. This is for our patrons, by the way, on Patreon who are watching this video since. If you subscribe to the right tier, you get to see the podcast on video ahead of time, unedited, folks. So you get to see Ryan showing off his wares. Ooh. Very nice. I love this thing so much. Very nice. So much. It's good. It's good. So I'm happy with mine, I have to say. And I'm glad uh, I didn't have to do the review because I would have been too effusive in my praise. I love this phone. <laughs> I really love the flip. I'm not sure I love the fold. Like, I mean, I haven't used the new fold, but I've used last year's fold and I liked it a lot. But I feel like if I had to pick one of the two, for me, it's definitely the flip. You know, I would have said the same because I love smaller phones and I, I was like, oh, a big phone. I'm never going to be into that, but I'm, I'm really into it. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, it's just that I haven't managed to change my workflow to accommodate the real estate. And ultimately, I don't think I need the real estate. Like... So I'd rather have something more compact in my pocket. And I just kind of love the, the fashion angle. I, I, I know it's very kind of, you know, superficial, but I do believe that our personal electronic devices are a part of us, a part of our personality of who we are. And so, you know, you, you pick your glasses and your watch, you know, to mean something to you. Or like, if you like cars, you, you, like, you pick a car, not just because of its performance and its usability, you pick it because of the way it makes you feel emotionally. And that's real and that's valid. And phones shouldn't be any different. I entirely agree. You, which yeah. is why I'm also so excited about the, the Pixel 6, because it finally looks like a really interesting design from Google, you know, in the same way as we had the Oreos, you know, or Panda or whatever it was. Uh, the Panda 2XL is still one of my favorite phones from a design sensibility. I just love the way it looks. Yeah. So I feel this is, this is exciting. And, uh, you know, since we're speaking of Samsung, we kinda, I kind of had to go there to let people know that I'm reviewing the Flip right now. Let's speak about the software updates and Chinese makers, because I think this is the biggest challenge. I mean, OnePlus is kind of there, although they've come gone, you know, a few different directions with this. For a while there, they had very few phones to support and things were really solid. Now they have more phones to support and it's, it's a little bit of a mess. Of course, now they're, you know, Oxygen OS is merging with Color OS. The OnePlus Nord 2 that I'm playing with is actually the first phone to do that. And it's uh, right here, folks. And frankly, I don't find it to be any different than say a OnePlus 9 yet. So that, that, you know, that speaks to the software expertise of the BBK group to make this seamless. But I think we're going to see better, probably better software updates and support from OnePlus at least uh, in this, in this market, hopefully going forward. But I'm more worried about the rest of them, you know, the Vivos and the, the Oppos and the real me's and all the Xiaomi group, Poco, Redmi, all that. I'm not yeah. seeing any any interest from these companies in updating their phones beyond a year at most. I mean, not security, maybe two years for security. And even then that's pushing it. I think for sure you don't get one more than one OS updates on the really expensive ones. And never mind the really affordable, really awesome phones that these companies are making. I don't think you're going to see anything on those. And as you said, you know, e-waste is real and this is a problem because if you're in India or something and you buy that affordable Poco phone for $250 and you're very happy with it, you know, you're, you're probably going to be tempted to get rid of it after a year or two to get the next thing when really you could probably hang on to it just an extra year. Maybe not too much longer because the specs are a bit low. 
And it's not just a matter of hanging on to it necessarily. If it continues to get updates, then that's going to increase its resale value and make it so that it might end up in someone else's hand rather than a landfill. You just want to keep these devices in use. Yeah. It's a good point. So that's my segue, by the way, to speaking about the Vivo X70 series, which has leaked heavily this week. And I don't know if you follow this, Ryan, but I know my audience, a lot of folks are in India and Asia and other parts of the, the world where they get Vivo phones. I've been very lucky to get the flagships sent to me by Vivo, the X50 and the X60 most recently, and then the X70 is coming out already soon. I think the X60 was just out in... I want to say January, February, March or so. So usually it's once a year, the X series. So I think that's their flagship series. And the X50 and X60 had the awesome gimbal cam. I got to play with that. And that's that's one of the few things I like is that we, because we don't cover a lot of the Vivo stuff. Android Police mostly focuses on the US and North American audience. But the uh, the Vivo cameras are fun. And the gimbal was really, really cool. And I like that. And I wish we had it in the US because it was pretty wild. Yeah. For sure. It's interesting to me that they went through all this trouble of creating this technology, which I think was worth it. Like it, particularly for wide angle video, it really made a difference. Maybe we don't have all the right specs because this is a, this is a leak, but yeah, the fact that we're not seeing gimbal here is, is a bit of a bummer. So just to give you some idea, folks, there's three models. There's a Vivo X70 Pro Plus. That's like the super high end that has a 1440, so 2K display uh 6.78 inches 120 hertz amoled of course hdr 10 plus the usual kind of madness 32 megapixel punch hole selfie camera did you see the uh, the aperture on that primary camera i know that's the thing that's got me the most excited frankly yeah. it's like wow look at that f over 1.5 like what it's kind of crazy right that is a that is gonna be chunky <sighs> so are you excited about it <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're not going to get this here, really. I mean, you can import yeah. it. Yeah, you know, I'm not a big fan of importing devices because there's almost always some sort of issue. Well, it's the 5G mostly that you don't get. Yeah. But so 50 megapixel Samsung GN1, that's the super sensitive sensor we've seen on the Xiaomi Mi 11 Ultra. And actually, it was also on the Vivo X60 Pro Plus last year, or well, this year, but the previous model, which I have, which also has the gimbal. That one has four cameras. It has a gimbal ultra wide. It has the GN1 50 megapixel main. It was not as good as an aperture, but still pretty great. And then it has two telephotos, a 2X non stabilized portrait lens, which is really weird because that 50 megapixel can certainly take good portraits. Although I guess the lens is optimized for portraits, it's a bit narrower. And then you have a 5X periscope on. This is the X60 I'm talking about. So this looks mm -hmm. like a similar setup, but with a 48 megapixel ultra wide, a 12 megapixel portrait, 2X, and an 8 megapixel periscope, which they don't specify, but I assume if it's a periscope, it's going to be 5X. And the thing that struck me about the X50 and X60 Pro that I've used, Pro Plus on the 60, is that that 8 megapixel like 5x periscope is it doesn't suck like it's really interesting how they're imaging i think generally bbk group even though vivo is a little bit of an outlier inside of bbk their imaging stack is really solid like i was kind of blown away i'm like this is only an 8 megapixel you know periscope and of course the f-stop's very periscopy right like it's not the yeah. best not the best lens for low light but in good normal daylight they took fantastic zoom shots up there with 12 and higher megapixel periscope lenses. So I was just like, wow, this is impressive. And so I presume they're going to continue with this on the on the Pro Plus. Snapdragon 888 Plus, maybe, it looks like. Yeah, and then uh, 4,500 milliamp hour battery. And finally, wireless charging on a, on a Vivo phone. I mean, they all the top of line X series so far, that was my big thing that I didn't like about them. No wireless charging. And this looks like 50 watt wireless and 55 watt wired. So then you have the pro and the non pro, the slightly and more models. The chipsets models. on those are interesting, huh? Yeah, let's talk about that. So let's quickly go through the other specs 6.56 inch AMOLED 120 hertz 1080p this time, same 32 megapixel selfie camera, 50 megapixel primary rear, but they didn't specify for the GN1. It might not be a GN1, it could probably be an IMX 766. The sensor in the Nord 2 and in the ultra wide on the uh, OnePlus 9 series 
and on the Oppo Find X3 Pro. And then we've got, let's see, 12 megapixel for ultra wide. Mm, that's kind of low for an ultra wide, at least on a pro ish phone. 4450 milliamp hour, 44 watt charging. And that was an X, that's an Exynos. Then the 70, the base model, I guess, of this flagship has the same selfie, a 40 megapixel main, a 12 megapixel ultra wide, and 12 megapixel portrait. And that has a Dimensity 1200, correct? Uh, do, according to leaks, which who knows, uh, a Dimensity 1200 or an Exynos 1080 may be varying by market. Yeah, could be. But uh, for China, it might be, um, might be an Exynos because, you know. Yeah, with the Dimensity, maybe if it comes to India or Media something. tech being Taiwanese. Yeah. I think the Dimensity, though, BBK Group has been using it a lot. I now have the Nord 2 with it. I have a Poco X3 GT. That's a, that's a Dimensity 1100. So, I mean, we're seeing more of the higher-end dimensities pop up on BBK Group and Xiaomi Group phones. Yeah, we have. It's unusual, but I'm really glad to see it because, uh, you know, MediaTek for so long, they were, uh, you know, budget uh, at best. You saw them in uh, embedded devices, uh, some smart devices, smart displays, that sort of thing, and like the cheapest of the cheap phones. And they were ridiculed. You know, they had issues, they had performance problems, and MediaTek's stepping up. Um, I still don't know, uh, and I should probably look into more, speak to them more about how they're... Uh, better adhering to the GPL and uh, their legal requirements in, the, in that regard. But I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that we're finally starting to see them compete at a level with, uh, like, as we're seeing here, if it's being considered at the same time as, you know, a higher end Exynos chip, we might start to see them in the U.S. competing with, you know, Qualcomm. And that would be very, very good for customers. Well, it has been very good for customers in the low end with the Demon C700, frankly. So I want to see more of that in the U.S. for sure. But basically. I think these phones look interesting. I mean, again, you know, don't get too excited. You're not going to get these unless you import them. And I would really only look at the Pro Plus here because of the wireless charging and, you know, everything but the kitchen sink kind of deal. It's it's definitely interesting. It's definitely also interesting they've gone Quad HD on this instead of 1080p because all their flagships have always been 1080p. And so they're kind of stepping it up. Speaking of BBK Group and news about camera systems is an oppo kodak rumor that's been swirling around and that seems to be back now and uh, the news is that you know oppo and kodak are working together on a flagship that would have two 50 megapixel cameras but then again i'm like wait a minute this seems kind of familiar because the oppo find x3 pro has two 50 megapixel cameras it doesn't have kodak branding though it has remarkably good, well-tuned equivalent cameras in terms of color science because they're identical Sony IMX766 sensors. And I cannot understate how great Sony sensors are. I always feel more excited about their sensors than their Samsung sensors. Yeah. Even though I have to say the higher-end Samsung sensors are very, very good these days. Like the Xiaomi Mi 11 Ultra I have take some incredibly great pictures with the main camera. But I would argue that if I looked at the result of the pictures I take, the Find X3 Pro is one of my favorite. I might not even end up tweaking an editor. It's so good. Like my Pixel photos, I almost always tweak them in Google Photos in, in a little bit of a way. It's always a really solid platform for developing the photo. Yeah. But I find that with the Find X3 Pro in particular, I just like, it just nails it every time in terms of color science and, and the way it exposes the shadows. And I, I don't know, like there's something there. Oppo is onto something. And of course, I think Sony really helps them. Maybe Kodak's involved. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, when it comes to BBK brands licensing uh, names for <laughs> camera stuff, uh, the history here is not great, right? No. Like, I'm thinking of one <laughs> plus and Hasselblad. So I don't, I don't know if it's going to mean anything. Furthermore, if you're looking for a company to license uh, a name for or color science tech for or to have you collaborate, Kodak with how well is your not it. Works, yeah, Kodak's like bottom of the list of names you would consider. Like, really, these guys didn't even like. Think of the history of Kodak, the company that rejected the idea of uh, uh, digital cameras when they invented them, that they went to bankruptcy. They, they, does Kodak even have almost anything to do with uh, color science or uh, digital camera photo processing now at all? I don't so know. this isn't a name I would think of for sure, or that I would care about if I saw it on a box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Polaroid is, is uh, in the same boat, I think, although they have 
they're a little closer to my heart because they're so they're such a quirky product, right? The the original idea of Insta instant photography was pretty awesome. I mean, today we kind of take it for granted, but you know, when I was a kid, like you would have to wait to get your photos developed and you you know, you only took a few because you didn't know if you're going to mess up. And so, and it costs a lot of money to get them developed. So having a camera that you push a button and it spits out a photo on it, out of the other end was very, very cool. And, you know, so I'm a little closer, it's a little closer to my heart when I read Polaroid on a, on a branding sheet, but uh, Kodak, yeah, I mean, Kodak is, is a kind of such a sad story. They had so much good stuff going for them. Yeah. Like they made, as you said, the first digital camera in the lab. And then not only that, but even uh, before they disappeared, they finally realized their mistake and made some incredible uh, digital camera backs uh, that added on to that, you know, film DSLRs for Nikon and for Canon um, that were state of the art and the, you know, the best for, for professional use for a very brief period of time until Nikon, Canon and Sony really got into it. Yeah. And so they were there for it, but then they completely missed the boat somehow. So, yeah. It's really too bad. Weird branding idea there, right? But you know, again, branding, it's branding. Who cares? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but I thought it was interesting and also kind of made me eye raise an eyebrow on a dual 50 megapixel camera as well. Yeah. I mean, that's what we already have. So, um, but what's more interesting to me is this Moto News and it's not Moto US. This is like Moto China, I think, that showed this, this concept. Again, another, yet another concept of what I call true in quotes. I'm doing air quotes right now. Uh, wireless charging, meaning wireless charging where you don't have a pad and you don't have to be in contact with a surface of some kind like we have today. So this is wireless charging like up to like, I don't know, like it's ridiculous. Have you watched the video? It's actually pretty damn incredible. So I actually didn't have time to watch the video because yesterday I was so drowning in Android 12 stuff. So I, the, this right. is, I, I, I heard the news in, in passing, but the, uh, the details are still uh, for me a little... Uh, I, I, I'll believe it when I see it in person. So up to 10 feet, uh, up to an angle of 110 degrees, and even through hands and like basic phone packaging. It, and it just, it's just kind of surreal. And it's kind of, it's got this like, you know, flat array antenna thing that you'd see on like a, in a corporate Wi-Fi setup, right? And it looks like it's all beam forming, right? They have yeah. hundreds of, maybe even thousands of microscopic, you know, semiconductor antennas in there that they can tune to beam this beam of energy, I guess, directly to whichever device in that field. And I think it's fascinating. I think it, you know, it shows where we're going. I am have many questions. I have so many questions. Around health. Yeah. I mean, look, I want to be very clear, folks. I'm an engineer. I do not believe that radio waves are harmful to humans. I think the problem is that it's the energy levels that can cook. Like microwaves are real and they cook things. They heat up things. They heat up exactly. water molecules in tissue. And that's the danger, right? Like you don't want this thing to suddenly burn you, right? And so I don't have any qualms with them doing this. I'm just more like, how are you making it so that there's none of this risk? Because yeah. this has got to be high energy. I would like to know which frequencies it's using more about like the beam forming tech. Cause I would, my, my bigger concern would be uh, um, how it recognizes and targets the device. Because what if uh, you know, it mistakes, I don't know, the wires in your wall as uh, it starts targeting a bunch of power towards them and you end up with a fire like that. Yeah, that would be my exactly. concern. I, I want to know more about the, the specifics of how it works to understand what the risks are. <laughs> but it sure is impressive. And I hope that in the next 10 years, we're going to see this as a viable technology in our homes. I would love to have an array on the wall in my office to just beam power. This can do four devices at the same time. So let's see what happens, right? I think this is, yeah. this is my first time I've seen something where I was like, okay, this looks really good. There have been a few of these demos. Yeah. There've been a few of these demos before, but they're always like, you know, you hear about them at CES or, uh, you know, it's, it's something that someone did in the lab where they're like, we transferred power 10 feet. And it's like, yeah, it was super directional and you, your efficiency was like 3%. So who cares? I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about the specifics of this and its actual commercial fe feasibility. If this is losing 
know, 95% of its power, who fucking cares? But if, if, if it's actually efficient, if it uh, can charge a phone at a decent rate, you, you could even use it for other things. You could use it for a bunch of IoT applications. If you want to have a security camera outside and a power supply inside, you keep your things topped up, you know, wirelessly without having to run a wire or plug them into charge. There are a lot of other potentially interesting applications. Yeah. It seemed to me the most compelling demo I've seen to date. Um, of course, it's a video, so, you know. I, I don't think they would do this if it was fake. Like, there's just no reason for them, right? I'm sure it's real. Like, yeah, I'm it's sure it real, works. right? Yeah. But, I mean, at the same time, it's like, okay, well. There have been other videos. What gotchas are, are waiting here that we don't know about? I know. It's still super cool. I, I, I encourage you to watch the video if you uh, get a chance because it's like, wow. Check it out, folks. I'll put the link to the android police story of course on uh, in the show notes and the video will be in there so check it out all right what else we got to the this week oh lg is back in the news with some phone stuff but it's not really phone stuff and it's not the same lg (laughs) no exactly lg is a big company they make a lot of things they make components and they make materials and they make batteries in fact Uh, if you guys have been following the the Bolt EV, the Chevy Bolt Saga around the fires, around the bad, defective batteries, those were made by LG Chem. I, I'm not singling them out for it. It's uh, manufacturing defects are very tricky in batteries and it can happen to everyone and anyone. And it's kind of a bummer that it happened to LG and it is affecting Chevy in, in an otherwise very good electric car, the, the Chevy Bolt. But LG Chem, same, same company, makes glass, uh, makes... Plastics makes materials that are used in technology, you know, for their for their TVs particularly and their their phone and their well, not their phones because they don't make phones, but when they used to make phones, the displays used a lot of technologies and materials developed by LG Chem. And so they are now having apparently developed a folding glass for folding phones that will not show the crease anymore or minimize how much crease it shows. Exciting because that's the thing, you know, I'm, as I'm writing my review of the flip three here, I'm like, yeah, you know, like I had to write it down. It doesn't bother me. I've kind of like my eyes have adapted to the crease when I see it and most, but I still feel it right. Like the feeling is actually more obvious than the seeing. Yeah. And, but I had to write in my review and say, you know, that's, that's the thing. That's the one drawback, one of the drawbacks and the lip around the screen as well. The fact that it has this, the bezel is actually raised a bit so that when you'd want to do swipe gestures and stuff, it's a little weird. See, people complain about that, but it hasn't been a problem for me. And the, the bezel is smaller. No, no, I'm not actually finding it to be a problem for me. I just mentioned it in my review because I know some people are going to notice it and go like, ah, yeah. oh, this is weird. And I do think it's a drawback. I think it is still nicer to have a perfectly smooth surface. And they don't have that here. So this has nothing to do, of course, with this LG folding glass because this is only addressing the crease. But hey, kudos to uh, LG for being in the news on something mobile related and (laughs) to improve the situation with folding phones. I think that we all want better folding phones. And I think this is part of the reason I'm so excited the Flip 3 over the Fold 3 is this is the first real democratization of a of a folding phone. Like you're going to say a lot of folks listening here say it's a thousand dollars, Miriam, but you have to understand that. Yes. If you're in India, that's expensive. If you even in Europe where subsidies aren't as high, it's still expensive. But in the U S where everybody buys a thousand dollar flagship without even thinking, because Samsung always has deals. The carriers always have deals. It actually becomes a very viable, viable product for a lot of people. And now they have the choice. Do I buy a, you know, equivalent size? Do I buy a Samsung Galaxy S21 Plus or do I buy the same size screen in a Flip 3? Now, the only thing you really lose is the telephoto, which as we know is kind of a compromised telephoto on the S21 Plus. It's a 64 megapixel with a technically an optical zoom of 1.1. So it's not really a telephoto. It's a cropped, you know, BS solution. Yeah. And you lose a bit of battery capacity, which I think is the biggest compromise you make with the Flip. But that being said, like it's viable and any technology like this LG glass that makes it even more viable. I'm, I'm like excited about it. It's it's great stuff. I, uh, uh, again, being critical, just like with uh, Motorola's claims, I'm I'm interested to see how this actually works in application and in person because some of LG's claims, uh, are pretty grandiose. They say that this coating, coating, a couple micrometer thick coating on PET film is as hard as glass. 
I don't know about that. So I, I would I would want to see it in person because Samsung made similar claims. Oh, we have real folding glass. It's like, yeah, you have this much folding glass topped by this much plastic. Yeah, let's speak about that because I'm a little kind of confused by that. Like, okay, so the big news, right, with the Z Flip last year, and then we got that on the Z Fold 2 and the Z Flip 5G later, was... Hey, unlike the original Fold, there's glass in this display and it's very thin and it folds and it's flexible. And we were like, awesome. And when I bought my Z Flip original, not the 5G, you know, and eventually returned it because I just want to experience it and I wasn't going to get a review in it. So I just went ahead and bought one. I have to say that it felt like glass touching it. It was great. But then the Z Fold 2 comes out and the Z Flip 5G comes out and they come with this plastic screen protector pre-installed that was extremely rubbery in feel and completely killed the smooth glass experience I had with the original flip. And yes, you could remove it. Samsung wanted you to come to them to do it, but you had the option to remove it. Yet, why did they put that on? And then continuing now to the Z Fold 3 and the Z Flip 3, there is still this screen protector. Now, it's much better. It's not that sticky, rubbery feel to it. It feels a lot more like glass. It's a much improved polymer, clearly a plastic. But it catches dust at the edge. Like, why is it not incorporated into the display proper? Why is it still optional that it's sanctioned that we can remove it, that Samsung will do it for you or prefers you don't do it and they do it, why is all that there when the whole shtick was glass and it felt so good? What's your take on this? Do you think it's just too fragile? So my understanding is that uh, even when you remove the screen protector, the surface you're touching, that's still not glass. There's okay. uh, it's, a, it's a sandwich and there's another polymer on top of that. And then on top of that's the screen protector. I might be wrong, but that was the way it was explained to me by Samsung PR. Okay. And uh, secondarily, yeah, you write the... Uh, um, there was, I don't remember what material the original, Z, uh, the original Fold used, uh, and I think they were actually pretty mum on the details, and we weren't important enough to be told. But the uh, the new one, the uh, original Z Flip, uh, this had the uh, um, sort of TPU, the flexible, uh, I think it was TPU, um, whatever it was, it was a, a flexible coating on top of the, uh, uh, the display meant to protect it, and obviously flexible enough that when you fold it with the crease, it would, it would, uh, uh, it wouldn't snap or break or uh, be damaged. And now they've switched to a PET film. And uh, I think it's a good move. PET is a, a nice material. But if you, if you think about it, if you remember, you know, what PET is on the display, the screen protectors we used to buy for phones in like 2007, 2008, 2009, those were, that was PET film, that, you know, flimsy plastic, you replace it every three months. Yeah. And uh, Samsung still treats, the way I see it is that they're treating these, uh, PET films and the TPU film and all of these screen protectors, it's sort of like a condom for your phone screen. It is a uh, consumable part that you can take it into a U-Break iFix or uh, that you can send into Samsung. And if you get it scratched or dinged up, you can replace it without having to replace the screen. So the damage on the screen is permanent, but damage on the screen protector is replaceable, even if the part isn't user replaceable. Yeah, I still think they should just build it in and it would be flush to the whole thing and under the, 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 the frame, like the, the bezel. It should at least be larger and closer to the bezel because on my unit, I don't know if yours was the same, but mine twice on two different units, it's installed crooked. So the oh, uh, PT. <laughs> I haven't even looked to see if it's installed crooked. Now that you pointed out, I don't want to look because I don't <laughs> want it to be disappointed. I've already mentioned in my review and the writing I've done so far that it's a dust magnet. It's gathering a lot of dust in my pocket and you can see the edge more because of it. And it just doesn't look good. And I'm if it's unnecessary, then why is it there? And like, I know what you're saying, but like yeah. either make it a permanent thing as part of it especially now that it's no longer this rubbery feel and it's better quality or just drop it completely and people on their own, you know, I'm kind of on the side of like, leave it and just make it a permanent thing that you can't even remove. Like at this point, you know, like what difference is it going to make, you know, <laughs> like unless you close your folding phone onto something that could damage the screen, right? Your chance of damaging the screen because this thing is closed most of the time in your pocket is much actually lower than a phone that doesn't fold in your pocket, right? Yeah, like I you're mean, not going to put it face down on something that's going to scratch the screen anyway, because you're always going to close it first. But I mean, even on my original Z 
Z Flip, which uh, obviously it had the softer screen protector on it, but I have some scratches on here. And it's not from setting it down on a surface. It's from stuff being attached and stuck into my thumb. Yeah. No, it's from stuff stuck in my thumb, like little bits of sand you can't see. And you do right. a scroll and that gouges a nice little, so. That makes sense. Yeah, but look, there it is. Hopefully we'll see some less creasy folding phones with this fourth generation from Samsung. And really, where is everyone else on this, right? This is where I'm starting to think like, okay, Moto is not in the, the game at all because the, the Razer 2, the second Razer, the 5G is a great phone, but it's a year old now and it never had the quality, in my opinion, of display that we're seeing on Samsung. And, and I, I mean agree. that in every sense, like the ruggability of the display, the, the resolution, the color quality, everything right? It, it's not 1080p. And then we have Xiaomi, which has a phone, but I haven't seen it yet. Some people have played with it, but it looks Huawei. basic. And, and like Huawei and Xiaomi both have one, right? And they're very much like copies of the Z Fold 2 almost. Yeah, but they're not, they're clunky. Like the Xiaomi one is really big and the Huawei one, you know, the original one folded the wrong way and the new one is essentially a Z Fold 2 copy. And, and it's a, it's a Huawei. You're not going to be able to use it if you do and bring it here. So because yeah. of GMS, lack of GMS. So like, it's amazing to me that they're just like three generations in now, right? Like this is, this is real. And this is what I mean by democratizing the thing. Like I had a few times I used the Flip 3, like last year when I used my original Flip and my Flip 5G, which at and sent me. Uh, I want to thank at and by the way, on the show, because they're the one who sent me the Z Flip 3 here to review. So thanks. They sent me the G... Z Flip 5G last year as well. So every time I've shown or used that phone in these phones in public, people have asked me questions, right? Obviously. I'm sure it's happened to you as well. But I had a conversation with the guy at the bar down the street. The bar down the street is also a coffee shop. And he was like really interested. And I was like, yeah, I think, I think, dude, I think this is last year I wouldn't have said go buy one, but this year, like, go buy one. I think the time is here. And I, I am as, as concerned as you are about uh, Samsung's head start here. By the time the other relevant companies start actually producing folding devices, Samsung's going to have a three, if not four generation or more lead. And we all know that uh, this took Samsung quite a lot of iteration to get right. And if, if, if we're saying that now, as of the Z Flip 3, that they're getting it right, it, it took a while to get to this point, right? Yeah, So, but it didn't, if you think about it, it's really only been two years since the original fold was a disaster, right? Yeah. And the other thing is it's water resist. I don't, I can't wrap my head around that. Oh, it's so cool how it works. I love that. Oh, it's the, that's it's the, amazing. An ama like the most ingenious approach. Don't waterproof it. Just waterproof the two components and then the hinge, leave it open. Screw it. Oh, that's so smart. hundred percent. And in a way, actually Moto has been doing that with their nano coating on a lot of their phones. They, they literally cover the entire electronic stuff with a coating that repels water. Now, it's not as water resistant as what Samsung's doing on these phones, right? Because they're literally isolating the two halves of the electronics inside. But the idea is still sound that you, you don't have to actually waterproof ingress of the actual phone, but the components inside the phone, which is really yeah. smart. So speaking of Samsung, we mentioned this briefly earlier in the show. There's rumors that Samsung is adding OIS on the next generation Galaxy A series phones, and I'm jumping up and down with joy because I want this to be the segue for the rest of the industry to start adding OIS in almost everything that's $500 or more as a complete, normal, decent, everyday, like you don't even think about it thing. Everything should have OIS it. makes such a huge difference, folks. I never, ever believe any marketing that tells you otherwise. Yep. When they justify they don't have OIS, they're justifying they were trying to save a buck. It is ridiculous. I will state that, uh, or I will defend that EIS in video can be pretty effective. Oh, video, yeah. it's all different. I'm talking about yeah, yeah. for stills. But for photography, absolutely. You can expose much shorter time with OIS. Yep. And as such, you get much less blur, especially if you're trying to take pictures of kids running around. You know, night mode's never going to work for that because it multi-stacks frames. The, the whole point of night mode is that it, it takes hundreds of photos in a row and then lines them up because that's, you know, and it's not just for night mode. OIS has advantages even just for uh, any HDR oh, shot. Oh, yeah, when, for sure. Wherever you have multiple frame processing, if, if those frames can be, you know, stabilized, the results are going to be that much better yeah. across the board. So it's not just... Said, if you can keep that shutter speed low to start with, you're, you're ahead of the game. You're in, a, you know, you're in a better place. So I think 
this is exciting. I honestly did not expect that. I, I've actually, my big fear has been to see Samsung drop OIS on some other, in the same way they've gone with the glass stick back on the S21, the FE. See, I like the glass stick. I think it's good. Oh, glass stick. Such a great <laughs> and terrible name all at the same time. I'm so conflicted. I hate it and I love it at the same time. It's kind of genius, glass stick. And then you want to slap them on the side of the face. Like, what the <laughs> hell were you thinking, Samsung? This is a terrible name. But at the same time, you're like, the dork in me is like, oh, that's good. <laughs> and it know? is the ni- some of the nicest plastic you'll ever touch. It is it is very it is nice. It's so plastic. good. It is yeah. so nice. Yeah. So OIS on Galaxy A series, I think this is good news. And I'm super excited that OnePlus did not do the wrong thing and remove OIS from the Nord 2. The Nord 2 camera, guys, it's like it's so good. It's, it's like an IMX 766 with a wire. It's essentially the f- main camera of the Oppo Find X3 Pro, which I just praised earlier, in a phone that costs 500 bucks. Wow. And then let's talk about the Note because the trademark wasn't renewed by Samsung. And so what does that tell us? Is that, should we read, are we reading too much into this? I, I, I um, personally, I'm not reading that much into it. I, the, the way companies handle trademarks, it's not like they've abandoned the note trademark forever. Uh, I just, I think that it's clear they didn't have a plan this year. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to start trademarking a name that's not going to apply. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, uh, would you be in the camp that, yeah, there's no note this year, but, and, and if, if so, do you think it's just a supply issue or do you think that the note is gone? Yeah, I bet the note's dead. I think that the Fold has essentially replaced it and that uh, if the only differentiating factor now is the fact that it has a stylus, they'll just start selling a stylus as an optional accessory for the S21 like Yeah, but we need a silo. Everybody I've talked to wants a silo. Everyone wants to store the little s pen in their little thing see i th- i feel like that's more of a uh a tech blogger thing like us we're refined enough we're sophisticated enough in our interests and the phones we've used that we're like i want somewhere specific to put it but a lot of the people the the audience that buys the note is uh put it bluntly uh a generally not quite sophisticated as sophisticated audience and i think they're fine putting it in the case like that's like like they did with the uh, uh z flip 3 you can you can buy the uh S Pen for that, it attaches on the case, and it, it's fairly well done. I think if the case is nice enough, even people like us might accept it. And the sort of <laughs> uh, older audience that uh, uh, tends to prefer having a stylus to interact with their phone will we'll probably accept it in that way as well. You know, it's interesting, your, your view on the Note. To me, it's not at all what I'm seeing with the Note audience. For me, the Note audience is tech-savvy, early adopter, but productivity-driven as well, and not necessarily older, not necessarily always just tech savvy and your adopter, but definitely the, there's a Venn diagram between the productivity crowd. And you're right, in that sense, the, the fold satisfies that to some extent. But everyone I hear is a hardcore note user that's not a tech journalist, because I'm not, I don't care. I don't want a S Pen at all, so I, don't, I really don't care. Yeah. But some people swear by them. And those people who are not tech journalists and swear by them are productivity monsters and they love their stylus in the silo. The whole point is that it's always there. It doesn't make the phone wider. You don't need a special case. It's built in. It's You'll never forget it. It reminds you if you forget because it has that sensor. I think that's something to be said. And, and you know, you're right that it doesn't seem to make much sense to have that many phones anymore in the flagship space for Samsung when they have the S series and the Z series now. But part of me says that is a bit of a compromise still. Like if they can add a silo to the Z Flip 4, Maybe. OMG. I think that would make it better for that audience. That yeah. then solves it. Then at that point, you cannot say anymore, well, you, you can't, you, there's no note and you're mad. Like the note users, from what I gather, will spend the money. They bought the note every year because they want the best Samsung made and they got it. And I don't feel like, I feel like the last note that we've had the 20 Ultra last year was at the time the best phone Samsung made. I think it was better than the Z Fold 2. I I was delighted by that phone. I love the way it feels in hand, the industrial design. The cameras were tops. I mean, the S21 is better, but that is, adds an extra, you know, telephoto. Of course, it's going to be better, more versatile. But at the time, I would have picked the Note 20 Ultra, even though I never used the S Pen over the S20 Ultra. 
Hands well, it had down. a better camera than the S20 Ultra. The better S20 cameras. Ultra had the, the autofocus issue, but... Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I, I think that it's always been kind of the thing, and it's a bit of a bummer. Like, I think that, uh, yeah, they need a silo in one of their phones. I don't care what, which one. Maybe. It's Samsung. They, they make them, like, they even... Ugh, they make so many phones. They can make one phone with a silo. See, I think that's going to change because uh, there was that news recently that they're being sort of audited by the parent company as a result oh. of uh, being not quite super profitable for the last two years. And <laughs> that's true. That, they're not doing so well. Yeah. So I think that they're going to consolidate the lines. And I think that uh, discontinuing the note is going to be part of that. However, I don't look at the trademark as being the uh, nail in the coffin of the note series. I think that it's it, if it's g- going to happen, this isn't the, uh, uh, the sign that tells me that that's going to happen or not. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. I'm just, you know, I'm just watching out from all my friends I know who are not tech savvy early adopters, but are productivity monsters and might not be quite ready for a fold yet and certainly want the silo for the thing because that's what I hear as feedback from them. You know, every time I ask, I say, so what do you think now that the fold has a silo? Are you going to buy that? I'm like, ah, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm still a little worried about like the reliability and I, I, I'm annoyed that I can't store the thing in a convenient way. And I'm like, hmm. I hear you. I hear you. Although I have to say that the cases, there is not just the Samsung ones, but I've seen more and more cases that support the Samsung stylus, one of the two, the smaller one, that because the phone is so narrow, right? Having the stylus uh, where the hinges or whatever is actually not, or on the other side, is actually not a bad deal because... It works okay in practice. I think that the the issue isn't so much... uh the stylus's location as it is some of the cases themselves. Uh, most of the cases that have the stylus built in are like compromised in little ways that like you can't avoid because of the fact right. that this is a folding phone. Uh, the the way it has to work from a design perspective imposes certain restrictions because you have a screen on the outside you need to be able See, to use as well you as you just on the justified inside. the silo right there. <laughs> it's true. A, a silo would would uh, unarguably be more convenient and better, but I don't know. See what happens. We'll see. Yeah. So Apple has an iPhone 13 event on September 13th. (laughs) Ha ha, funny Apple. Uh, But uh, so just beware that for the next month, all you're going to hear is Apple news. Um, I would like us to all remember that Android police exists, so please read it. I'd like us to all remember that I make a podcast that's primarily not about Apple, so please listen to it. Look, I'm just joking, but uh, prepare for the onslaught. Yeah. If you, like me, are an Apple fan, I'm a big Mac user, but I'm not an iPhone fan necessarily. I mean, I love iPhones. I think I recommend them to a ton of people. But for myself, I don't feel it's the right fit. I think you should uh, remember that there are some great non-Apple things happening soon, like the Pixel 6. And who knows what else? Probably some other stuff. So, you know, don't get all miffed by the Apple news. But yeah, do prepare. Hunker down, folks. It's coming. So I'm more excited for the new MacBooks. I cannot wait for the new 14 <laughs> I don't think we're going to see them on this event. I know. They're saying that's going to be another little bit later, but I want one so bad. Oh, me too. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually more excited about seeing uh, a new iMac that's 27 or 30 inches with uh, M1X or M2. That's when I'm going to upgrade this computer I'm using right now to record with. But my, I'm like, you know, I've got an M1 MacBook Air. That's going to stick around, I think, for a little while longer for me. I don't think I'm going to keep it the five years I normally do for a Mac, but I'm probably going to be at least keeping it for a little longer until something, for me, it's something smaller. I want a MacBook replacement, a 12 inch replacement. If they ever make that again. One can dream, but you saw my uh, blogging machine. I'm still using a 2014 uh, MacBook Pro. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the new models. Yeah, you really need one. Yeah. Hey, there's another thing that I didn't put in the show notes that, kind of happened this morning at least the verge has a review out i'm sure there's more i haven't had a chance to look at all the news but those silly facebook ray bands i mean look i don't want to be negative silly is probably they are silly but they're also not silly i think i'm a wearables person i worked at pebble i like my wearables and i'm excited to see a mainstream brand like ray-ban coming out with a partnership with somebody for some kind of smart glasses so Good. But Facebook, oh, Facebook, I feel very annoyed with this partnership. Yeah, I, I'm not, uh, um, 
I, I'm I'm hardly a conspiracy theorist or uh, you know one of those hardcore privacy advocates. I don't use only open source software and uh, you know you strip don't? all of. No. But you have a mechanical keyboard, Ryan. I do have a mechanical. Keyboard. You are Several. one of those people. I have a shelf of them, but uh, uh, I just I can't stand Facebook. They're an evil company. They have done so much harm to society and people and the world. Uh, they're 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 basically the worst thing that's ever happened to the internet, and uh, I hate them. And so I don't like the idea of them releasing a product with a camera that, oh, they're they're guaranteeing it's private and blah, 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 and whatever, man. I, I, I trust them zero. I'm 100% with you. I do not like Facebook very much at all. I use it primarily because in many ways, it's the only way I can connect with some of my friends who are less tech savvy, who are older, and just, you know... Uh, that's where they are, and that's my best chance of reaching them, either short of maybe text messaging them, and to see their lives unfold. And I have a presence on Facebook. I don't do much more than post links to my podcasts and reviews and stuff to it. Um, I participate by liking and you know commenting here and there on mostly friends and friends only posts, and just. Uh, you're right, though. It's the worst thing that's happened to the internet since the beginning, 100%. So, you know, okay, so they made these glasses with Ray-Ban. Ray-Ban's a good partner, though. I think that if your enemy's going to make good-looking, comfortable glasses, they're it. And from what I see... Well, they're just another... They're Luxottica sub-brand. They're part of that uh, big conglomeration that's been uh, anti-competitively cranking the prices of glasses to oh, uh, they? <laughs> several hundreds of dollars. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're I had awful. no idea. Yeah, I do love the classic Ray Ban design, though, and I think that these look uh, for smart glasses. They don't look, you know, like smart glasses. And that's a that's a that's progress. But how is this different than Google Glass, right? Like, I mean, of course, it doesn't have like an AR display on one eye only kind of deal. But but really, you know, you're wearing a camera on your face, and where's the backlash going to be on that? Huh? Where was the backlash with the Snap glasses, the three or four models they made? Those were you know, ugly too. I heard those were successful, but I've never seen a pair. And uh, I don't think there was much of a privacy backlash because most of the people who would have criticized them were, you know, people like you and me who we never saw them. We didn't really quite take them seriously. And even if they were apparently a commercial success, I don't know, it was never really seen as this sort of big thing we should be clamoring about when it comes to privacy. Yeah. Oh, well, they weren't a success. I only saw them in the hands of journalist friends that were reviewing them. So uh, I think somebody, I know someone who bought a pair but they're again they're tech savvy you know media person so look it's there i just want to put it out there in case you're um you know you want to check it out i'll link to the verges review it's interesting it's interesting i just wish facebook wasn't the word that i had to read in there yeah if it had been anyone else it would have been better and it is interesting from a technical perspective do you see how tiny the hole for the camera is and the frames don't even look any chunkier it's it's well that's like, what i'm saying that's yeah. the part that i was like you know, that's the Ray-Ban part. I think they have the expertise, right? Yeah. And I mean, maybe not Ray-Ban themselves, but whoever they're working with. And I don't think that's an in-house and Facebook thing. Like, I, I think that's, I mean, they have the Oculus team that has a lot of experience, that kind of stuff. So I suppose maybe, but I, I just, technically it's, it's. The hardware looks good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's technically interesting. And that's why I wanted to mention it, but don't buy them folks. Don't be that Don't person. give Facebook any of your money. No, don't do Oculus either. Forget it. That's my opinion. Well, let's wrap it up. That's a good way to end, right? By being a bunch of old, cranky journalists. Screw Facebook. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Ryan, you want to tell everyone where they can find you on the internet, your social media handles, all that good stuff? Uh, well, uh, they can find me at androidpolice.com, of course, where I write and say words. And they can see me at uh, twitter.com, where I write and say uh, more brash and uh, more words with less oversight at, at ryanhager.com which is spelled funny, but you can find it. Yes. You folks should definitely follow Ryan on Twitter and read his stories on Android Police. They're very good. I get a lot of news from Ryan. It's true. <laughs> and folks, you know where to find me on the internet. I'm at Tankerl. That's T-N-K-G-R-L. Like the comic book character Tankerl, just drop the vowels. That's my Twitter handle and my Instagram handle. If you want to discuss the podcast with me and Ryan, please hit us up on Twitter. If you want to look at pretty pictures taken with phones, pretty pictures of phones, go to my Instagram. You know, the podcast has a couple of YouTube channels associated with it for visual content, for extra, you know, little stuff that you can, you can look at the devices that I discuss on the show a little more close up. 
youtube.com slash mobile tech podcast is the main channel and uh, it's got mostly unboxings and that kind of stuff and then there's youtube.com slash mobile tech more it's a new channel on my producer and i kind of ramping up to try to cover the peripheral world around mobile things like travel tech smart home automotive stuff you know anything like the chargers the battery packs the humidifiers the vacuums all that fun stuff microwaves yeah so uh we're still trying to figure this one out but we'd appreciate it if you subscribed to both channels like the videos you know tell your friends comment all that good stuff you know youtube you know how it works and then uh, the podcast lives at mobiletechpodcast.com there's an rss feed there if you want to do the old-fashioned way of subscribing but of course you're on google podcasts apple podcasts pocket cast spotify everywhere good podcasts can be found so please subscribe and again tell your friends if your app lets you rate or review the show please consider doing that it helps with discoverability and there is a Patreon now. Those of you watching this video know this because you already are part of it. I want to thank my patrons for helping me out every month. If you want to participate, we have a bunch of different tiers. There's a Discord server where you can join me and chat. There is the video, uh, which is exclusive. Every week you get a video that's unedited. I mean, I remove the stuff that's really bad. And, you know, you get it a little before the audio podcast too, which is great. So consider joining the Patreon at patreon.com slash tankgirl. That's patreon.com slash T-N-K-G-R-L. I want to thank our latest patrons, Matthew B, for being a part of the team. Thanks, Matthew, for joining this week. And folks, I also want to thank our sponsor, Audible. Audible's been with the show forever, and they're a wonderful sponsor. You get a 30-day free trial, and you get to keep a book at the end if you join. So check it out, audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. That's audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. If you want to help us out and help them out, this is a great way to do it. You don't have to stay, but I hope you do because, you know, if you're like me and you're a bookworm, Audible is awesome. It's like basically reading books without reading them. They get read to you. It's really nice if you're on a road trip or say you're a delivery driver doing the FedEx run all day long and you want to keep your eyes on the road yet still listen to something fun. Audible's got you covered. They have a great selection of books. A bunch of authors even read the books sometimes. I I think it's great. There's not just books too. There's short form content. There is, you know, podcasts, whole bunch of stuff on Audible. So consider checking that out and, you know, helping us and helping them. Audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. I think you'll love it. Check it out. Thanks to Audible for being our longtime sponsor. And of course, thanks to you, Ryan, for being my guest yet again. Of course, Miriam, anytime. Wonderful. Well, I'll definitely have you on at some point in the future. And folks, we'll have another show next week, so stay tuned for that. Until then, cheers, everybody. This has been the Mobile Tech Podcast with Tank Girl, proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com.